Thank you. So we're going to make this pretty interactive. We've got a video to show which uh, highlights our project in Louisville. Steve was uh, in charge of for Concord. It was a 157-room AC hotel by Marriott in the new Lou district of Louisville. And uh, that one was done in wood frame modular construction. So you'll see it. It was a podium with four stories of wood on top of the podium. We'll run the video, talk just a little bit about it, and then open it up for questions. Also on the AC Nomad project uh, that Danny was talking about yesterday, which is the 27-story steel modular project, which will be uh, one of the biggest hotels ever done modularly, or the biggest. Is that right? That's correct. Whatever Danny says. Um, so let's run the video, and then we'll make it very collaborative. You can ask questions about both those projects, and I have a feeling there's going to be a good discussion. Modular construction is a new way of building hotels and other buildings. It's been done in Europe for a long time. It's really starting to pick up some traction here in the United States, and basically all the guest rooms in our hotel will be built in a warehouse in Pennsylvania and shipped to the site and then stacked like Legos in place. Eight are brought over each afternoon. They're prepped, unwrapped, gotten ready for the Lego stacking process. They swing them into place and they're able to get about eight done per day. The hugest advantage is the schedule. So we're saving on this project two and a half months. And then the other huge advantage is the quality. Henry Ford figured this out in 1910 or whenever he did, right? It's very similar. It's being built in a factory, in an assembly line, and everything is done one after the other. The modules move right down the line and you're getting the same quality module to module throughout the hotel, which would be very hard to duplicate out in the field in a conventional style construction. So we're totally excited to be coming to the new Lou Market. Market Street is incredible. It lights up at night and on the weekends. So excited to be a part of it. This hotel is going to combine meeting space, guest rooms and an amazing bar slash lounge. I think it's going to take a little time for all developers of residential slash hotel type construction to buy in, but it's definitely taking traction and I think it's going to slowly ramp up and yes, become the future of hotel building. Very cool. So a couple comments. Um, the two and a half months that we ended up saving ended up actually being three months. So we were in a race to the finish on this one. Um, we opened six days prior to the Kentucky Derby. So that was a big deal in Louisville. Obviously it was a huge weekend. So we were able to move it up uh, an extra two weeks. Our general contractor did a great job and we were able to open six days before the Kentucky Derby, which ended up making it about a full three months in time saving, which was huge. Um, from start to finish, it was 364 days, start to open. Um, we had a parking garage with what, I always forget, 290, 190 stalls, uh, right <coughs> in the back, which created a, a bit of a logistical issue. So this would have taken, um, easily would have taken 15 months conventionally to build because of the constraints on the site that the parking garage um, put on it. Um, what else can we... Tell about the job. I'm sure people want to know the budget. Um, so on this project, the cost of the modules was right around 50000 per key. Um, so if you take just the hard construction costs for buying from, we used a company called Champion, who's a wood building modular. The two big ones are Gurdon and Champion, and there's other ones out there too, but we used Champion on this project. It was about 50000 bucks a key to buy the modules. And then the rest of the building obviously was built conventionally. And as Danny explained yesterday, everything's hooked up from the hallways. The hallways are built conventionally, drywalled, painted, finished out conventionally. But inside the guest rooms, they are 98% complete. I mean, they look like the finished pictures that Danny was showing yesterday, except the TV is taped to the bed and maybe some of the mirrors and whatnot are taped to the bed so they don't get in trouble during shipping and the only thing when we open that door up to go in and do final you know put the sheets on the bed and all that kind of stuff is hang a tv hook up the tv hook up the fire alarm because that is home run back to the to the panel 
And that's really all that has to be done in the room to get it ready. Um, and, and maybe just for, for context, so what you have here are sort of two different styles of doing this. You've got the wood frame and you have got the steel. Um, uh, they're both different in some respects, but I think uh, in terms of the, the methodology, as you saw in the video, the podium was made of concrete and the stair towers and the elevator towers were CMU and cast in place, I presume, some mixture. Mm -hmm. So it's still a very similar system where the lateral force is picked up by the vertical cores, but the modules themselves can hold their own weight and hold the weight of their friends on top and, and below them. Um, there's other ways to do it, but this is a sort of the most traditional way that, that in both instances we're doing it that way. And so Danny told you yesterday about the upfront coordination that takes place. You know, Danny looks at it from the designer side, but he does see the construction side. Steve um, was knee deep in the project way earlier. There's way more coordination. There's way more making sure all those fine details work. Because uh, when the modulars hit the site and they start getting stacked, you can't make adjustments. If you have to be making adjustments, that's what throws the whole thing off. And I think Danny mentioned it yesterday that you've got to make the decision to go modular early. It's not get a set of drawings, decide if modular is it, or you know, a different type of construction. So we knew from the get-go that this one was modular. The architects designed it modular. We had the modular guys helping out with the different dimensions right off the bat. So, I mean, that's the number one thing. You're getting into modular, you need to make that decision at yeah. the front. It's just harder. <laughs> so you just need more time. I mean, I don't think the industry has settled enough for, for frankly, the design team and the development team to even know if fees have to be adjusted yet, because I don't think we've even shaken out and we know what the kind of standard amount of time it takes to do this properly. I think all of us are just trying to do it properly. But I do think there will be a reappraisal in some time where we kind of relook at the way projects come together. But I, th I would say at a base minimum, make sure your consultants know that it's going to take a little more time. And you know, we were just talking briefly, just on this project here, you know, while our modules, let's say our, our king room is identical all the way up the building, just in terms of if you just, you know, think logically about it, obviously the module on the fifth floor is carrying a lot more weight than the module on the 25th floor, right? He's carrying all of his friends up top. So in very subtle ways to be more economical with cost, our steel actually thins up as we go up in the mods. So while the king may be identical, we actually have three tranches of that one king room where our steel slenders up. Now that seems like a fairly straightforward structural response to a situation, but then ask yourself about like the perfect alignment you have of the shower control. But because the steel is a little thicker on the lower mods, it actually bumps over my shower control. And then I come up to the next tranche, I actually have to get my shower control back to where I want it. So there's tiny misalignments and things that you wouldn't think are an issue that become totally non-negotiable because it's steel in this case. You can't mess with it. And so your drawings may seem, okay, yeah, it's the king room. It's the same king everywhere. It's all modular. It's not actually the case. You end up having a different set of drawings for every module. And like on our facade, you can see the facade changes. That too has to be documented. So uh, I think the kind of plug and play mentality, which it is in a sense, in, in actual practicality, doesn't work that way. It's just a tremendous amount of document tracking. So I, I feel like I'm the bad news guy, but it's like it definitely requires a lot of extra vigilance on the document side. And Danny mentioned yesterday, you got to throw away the, that old mentality of combining really, truly making a team. Uh, Danny was able to pull on our 27th story Nomad project. Um, and I'm curious to make sure that it worked well, but when we were in early design, you guys were all going to use the same Revit model. Yeah. And that, so that pulled through, and, and was there behind the scenes <laughs> fighting that we didn't see? Or? No, no, I mean, we, we, we share Revit models. Yeah, I mean, so in, in our project here, the design team works in Revit, the architecture team works in Revit, the interior design team works in Revit, we're all one group. Our general contractor works in Revit too, so we hand over the actual model to the general contractor. Now they, they end up building a Revit model which is pure for their fabrication documents, but that even makes its way back to us as well. Um, additionally, what we did on this project, and if this is getting too technical, we can, we can zoom out a little bit, but our structural engineer, who's the engineer of the base building, is also simultaneously retained by the general contractor as the structural engineer uh, developing the steel shop drawings for fabrication. So we have uh, a tremendous amount of overlap. And so, you know, if I were to do this all over again, even I would insist that like the mechanical shop drawings would have to be drawn by our mechanical engineer on that side. So no, we, it, stayed, it stayed through. Definitely the GC who, who wants to do it at this level should be a GC who works in Revit. They're definitely gonna output PDFs and 2D for subs. That's fine, we know that's the way the world works. 
but but uh, yeah, for sure, the shared Revit model that, that happened. You had a question. I did. So as a developer, um, and, and really not knowing what the comparison cost between using this technique versus standard technique, what what was it that tipped you over the edge that said, you know what, I'm going to take a leap of faith here and do this? Steve, you want to take that one? Well, I mean, I, yes, I think we know what the project should cost conventionally, right? So if we looked at that, and, and well, Nulu specifically, and the costs were, it, it was going to be cost neutral. However, we picked up the time, so it's not really cost neutral because we made some money on the end of it. Um, I'm sure the same process went in New York. I mean, you guys know what it's going to cost conventionally, and everybody talked about it yesterday. It's the labor market. I mean, you never know what that's going to be. You get a defined... You get to control that risk a lot, a lot more with the modular piece of it. But, but if I don't, done right. <laughs> if done right, I mean. But I think your point. The, the, I think the subtext of your point is: what about all the risk? Because it hasn't been done before, and I do think it requires, uh, you know, some courage on behalf of the ownership group. Um, I think it requires an attitude of trust and support. I think I said this yesterday, but you know, if my ownership group wanted to like nail us for every single possible mistake, or we were to hold the general contractor accountable to every single you know, coordination issue that's happened thus far, the project would collapse. So I do think like the ownership group, and, and at least on our team, between Concord and our, and, our, and our landowner, taking the attitude that this is a team, that this is a team that we have to carry each other through this. And I think at least until this becomes industry standard, you're going to have to have participants who have that attitude, or it's going to be I mean, that was our experience. I don't know. If well, and years. look, in Louisville, like, we've been doing this a little while. So we had an architect that didn't do uh, modular. We had a GC that didn't do modular. But we have used both of those players a number of times, and we were confident in their teams to get together and work it out. So it wasn't like we were trying a new GC and a new architect, and we were all just going to figure out how the Lego stack. We, we had trusted, trusted team players in that to make sure that it went right. And it did. So we make, you know, um, strategically, Concord gave Steve a big amount of incentive to make the project successful. So by incentivizing Steve to make the project successful, if that team, the architect, fails or the general contractor fails or they don't work together, or he doesn't make sure that everybody solves problems and does it quickly and timely, um, that's key to it, to having the owner, like Danny was just saying, literally feet on the ground, entrenched in solving all the problems and taking it personally uh, makes a huge difference. Huge difference. Uh, yeah, I mean, I had some time up front. We knew this was going modular early, so even before really the design was going, I flew out to Sacramento and saw one that gets stacked. I went out to, I think, Texas. They had one that kind of gets, like, I, I know just as much as the GC does, so we were all kind of together in the room working out the details, and like I said, we had a good, a good team together and worked well. And I also, we have used, I mean, like our, these are, we're all doing kind of the firsts, so there is an opportunity for all of our vendor partners to get, you know, there's, that's a good opportunity to be in the first, the tallest, the blah, blah, right? So we lean on that too. So whether it's, you know, Legrand who's doing all of our switches and fixtures, we're doing something kind of specific and unique on our project, and so we have them in our office nonstop working with us to kind of build mock-ups with us. Uh, where's Lodging Concepts? They're in the room somewhere, right? Uh, they're providing a whole host of stuff for us, FFE in the rooms. We need a whole host of partial releases because the way things work in Poland, it's not how they work, they're gonna work that way for us. Um, uh, so, so that's another big part of the puzzle is getting your team members, you know, vendors being your team members to say, this is special, so show up for us and give us a hand. And, that, and people have been doing that thus far. Got a question over here. So <clears throat> you did the, the stick modular in Louisville, and you've done the steel, Danny, um, do you think it's not done yet. Well, <laughs> yeah. They're coming in January. But, but from what you've seen so far, uh, do you think you will pick up more time as you do this again and again and again? Obviously, there's a point where yes. The answer is yes. There is a little bit more time to be picked up. Um, nobody for 
of ownership is in here. So like on the New York project, you know, we buffered a little bit. We've given ourselves a little bit buffer with what we're telling, you know, ownership so that we've got a little bit of time. But um, there's, on a project that tall, you know, we're thinking there's five to eight months, you know, potentially. Yeah. And in New York, I mean, that's a big difference. It's, um, and I would also add to that too. Oh, there goes my mic. Um, you know, on, on the on the wood frame kind of five story podium, four story woods, you're gonna you're gonna ultimately flatline with the speed you can do because you're you're stacking horizontally and it'll go as fast as it can go, and that's great. For the urban infill high rise volumetric steel stuff, there's still a lot that we can do. So in this case, we're casting our core traditionally yeah. out of concrete. Yeah. You know, we investigated the precast situation. You know. I would say on a project like this, like hit a solid double, right? Don't do everything for the first time. We investigated the modular elevator system as well, which we looked to. It looked like it might be able to work. Turns out it needed a little more space than we had to give, so we didn't do that. But there are, you know, for my next one, we're definitely going to look at modular elevators. We're definitely going to look at the possibility of precast elevator cores. Um, there is more to be done. Uh, we're just, I think we're, I wouldn't say scratching the surface, but it's definitely the first out of the gate. There's a lot of lessons still to learn. I think there's some time to be picked up, but I think the real cost will be once you get more GCs that understand it and really the sub market mm -hmm. understand it. Because, I mean, that was one of my things when I went out uh, for this one because the GC was on board. He knew what it was going to take and how he was going to do it. The subs, when you, because there is some sub work. I mean, we stack these boxes and they're not just all done. You still have to go in and connect all the mechanicals and the corridors. There's still subs that have to be involved, drywall in the corridors. So, when we started getting pricing back, and I, I, me and the GC were on board with this, we had to sit down with those couple guys and be like, look, it's not like a typical. You're only needing about 35% of the manpower because you're not doing as much as you used to do. Um, I think that's where we'll see some cost savings once more subs are like, yeah, we only need five guys doing that one, not 15. So yeah. I think there's some time, but I think at the end of the day, once you get more people involved, the sub market's going to take to it and the GCs as well. It's just like VRF, you know, everybody's seeing those prices start to come in the line as more subs are getting more familiar with it. It's the same thing. They had to go and sit down and talk with these guys and then once, you know, at some point they're sitting across the table. I remember our GC tell me at some point you can see the light bulb come on and they're like, oh, that's it. You know, but if you just sent out a bid and asked for the numbers back in four weeks and then presented those numbers to ownership, modular would never get started. It tip, you know, There's a limit on the height on the steel. There's, there's no limit. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a concrete core building with steel around it, which is how every high, I mean, Burj Khalifa is the same system ultimately. I mean, you can keep going. There's nothing stopping us. Um, at, at, at some point, there may, the amount of steel at a certain height required at, say, the lower mods may be so dense and so thick, it may start to topple the economics. But structurally speaking, there's no issue. With wood, it's five stories on the yeah. podium, so. That's an argument they're going to cling to for some time. But they, like I said, there's still work to be had. You still need mechanical. You still yeah. need carpenters. You need fewer of them, 
However, we don't have enough of them as it is. So, I mean, I mean, if you yeah. talk to them sensibly about that, I think there's... We're looking at you a project in Philadelphia right now, which is a very strong union town. And, and at the, the first conversation was a lot of anxiety, but then there's a discussion of, well, here's how it would work. It's actually a scope compression. Yes, there is, but there's still certainly a ton of scope to do. And, and there's a good dialogue to have. And right now, this is brand new. And so there are certain cities like Boston that are going to be very, very anxious about it. And you know, we have a project in Long Island that was going to go modular. And then like the town board was like, don't even think about it. It's like, OK. Then that guy went to jail, and now we're talking about it. Um, but, but you know, I mean, it's just a, it's a political conversation, and that's going to that's gonna evolve as this evolves. From the general contractor perspective, get to you in one second, but from the general contractor perspective, you would think that, you know, like we had champion under the general contractor to make sure he was responsible for everything. So if the general contractor, if it's somewhat cost neutral, and the general contractor is responsible for the same amount of dollars of work in a less amount of time, they're going to make more fees in a smaller amount of time and be able to take those superintendents and project managers resources and get them onto another project and make more money in profits in a smaller amount of time. Yeah, you would think it would make sense. That would be good to be able to get, the, uh, to get a couple of names of some GCs that you've used before so that, so that I mean, it'd be great to place a couple of people in a, in, in a conversation sort of, yeah, uh, sure. I mean, there is some things that came out of Louisville that the GC wasn't expecting, which I knew. I mean, the fact that the furniture's, I mean, this is simple, but the furniture's in the building. If you knew how much boxes came out of the furniture and went into the dumpsters that are in the GCs, well, there's no more boxes coming out of the units because that's done. So there, and the punch out too. I mean, the punch out that is always a nightmare at the end of the project that the GC has to manage and get done he doesn't have to get that done on 90% of the building. Yeah, so there's there's basis. chunks of, yeah. you know, and the first adopters to this are going to realize, because they're going to keep that in your number unless you know and beat them up on it. So they're going to actually be a little bit profitable coming out of the gate. Yeah. And I think it's important for all of us to also, and I'll get you right now, but just for documentation. So like we're, we're spending a lot of time documenting this process. So that kind of data will exist so we can advance the conversation and have like that conversation that Carl just had with the GC and says, well, wouldn't you like to get off this job faster if the fee is the same? Certainly, there's an impact on the submarket. We have to talk about what that means. But the intent, of course, is can we bring manufacturing back to America and empower workers in a much, much different way? I mean, that's the bigger conversation here, right? Is that, like, I don't want to build this in Poland. We did it because we had to. But what if there were factories in every state in America doing this kind of work for hotels, for assisted living, for multifamily, for, for everything, right? And it's safer. I mean, we're stacking these pods up, and I mean, just the safety alone is, should yeah. should we benefit the workers. In Sixteen days. Or? I think less. I mean, you said eight, and we were stacking eight in the video, but they were stacking eight because we were had a big show on. Out. Right. Everybody was looking at it, and they were like, "We could stack twelve, and we were going to be done for the day." And I'm like, "No, no, slow it down." So. Um, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and that was the only day. Everybody left, and we were stacking 12, 12 a day. So. Marriott's done a great job publicizing yep. this. You know, they were there and they had their big event and all that. All right, go ahead, Kevin. What about dealing with municipalities and inspections and approvals? I mean, yep. you know, some of this stuff, you know, it, it, it's covered up. Obviously, everything in the back is already covered up, so you have to have some kind of way of being. That's a good question. So, the department on board, and then, like, you know, you have cities that won't let you put F and E in, and so you get a stocking permit, or right. but your permit's already in it. So, mm -hmm. so we. No, and Louis, I mean, no, no, I mean, you can't just stock furniture. Normally, you have to have at least a live sprinklers, right? So um, we had very early conversations. I know in Louisville, and I think most of the states all have a program to inspect modular units. Um, I don't know if that's the same in New York. So the states inspect and, and kind of give the, give the seal of approval to the modular company. So that takes the mods out. So then we're really just permitting anything that wasn't a mod, so the podiums and the corridors. And we went down early in Louisville and sat with those with the city like two or three times because we knew they were going to be like, what is this? And they were really receptive to it. So once they knew they had the seal of approval on the mods and that was not in their scope, then they looked at the other piece and it all went well. We had the conversation with the fire, and they're like, well, how long is it going to take for you once you stack to get the standpipes up in a wet building? And we told them something which was wrong. And, it was too late at that point anyway. But yes, you have to have those conversations early with the cities. 
they actually had um, the plumbing inspector was doing, after he came out the first couple times, I think he was doing uh, um, video inspections of the plumbing going in and some of the modules so he didn't have to come to the factory. Yeah, the state inspectors can go out to the factory. They can't do that in Poland, but the state inspectors could go out to the Champions factory and, and look at And no, I think they did that a couple times, and then they were done. No, they can. We, we have a third-party inspector. Oh, okay. So the, the Department inspectors. of Buildings yeah. requires us to do that. And I would say also um, a lot of heat goes on. In our case, let's say not even the welders, but the welding machines have to be certified by testing data that, that, that complies to, to New York or to America. And so your modular fabricator, your modular manufacturer, has to be deft at knowing how to deal with those issues because that is not us, it's not ownership's job to go vet the, a Polish welder, right? Um, so it's key that whoever you're working with has kind of gone through this process, if not once before, certainly vetted what the steps are because we at least began our job with all of those certifications in place for us to review and approve. There's a question back there. Yeah, you, you talked a lot about um, the requirement for trust between the different bodies, especially early on, and that collaborative approach. And it seems like you're leveraging the fact that it's a first time thing to get people to do that. So once that sort of fades away, is there something in the contractual setups that you would do to try and incentivize that approach? I mean, I'll say something briefly, but I think ownership will probably have more to say about this. I mean, I think. In very simple terms, having a pre-con relationship with the GC so they're involved with us at SD is important. So whether you're paying them on a pre-con monthly basis and then ultimately when you get to a GMP, you lock them into some form of a contract, you know, that's an ownership decision. But at a minimum, just get the GC, get the modular manufacturer at the table really early and make sure that the, and, and, and basically it's not even a choice. Everyone says that, bring in your GC early, get a good bid. It's not even a choice, you have to build a prototype and if you need the prototype to be designed, fabricated, and approved prior to beginning manufacturing, given the life cycle of a process, you must have that work happening during early DD. So I think it's an, you know, intrinsic to the process that the GC has to be there early. I think what contract you sign, I don't know if you have an opinion about that. Yeah, I would say, <clears throat> I don't know about a contract. I'd have to think about that more. But the first thing that comes to my mind is the worry that, similar to conventional construction, you're going to have owners who are going to try and do it for cheaper, use the trunk slammers, and I, I worry that once modular gets out there a little bit more, that hopefully it doesn't happen, but I think, I think it's, it's, it's going to, that some people will do it, think it's been figured out, and that they can just be an owner, hire an architect and a general contractor turn away and think that it's all going to work and it's going to be, you're going to have some real disaster projects that hopefully won't ruin it for the rest of, you know, the advancement of modular. And I think that'll probably happen. Just like it does in conventional you know, construction. If you don't do it correctly and just think that things are going to work themselves out, you find yourself in the same situation. Well, I know we, so we're invested. We think this is, this is the way to go. So we don't want that to happen. And I know working with Champion and Skystone, they don't, they are all, In they all know that it only takes one really bad project and everybody's going to say Modra doesn't work and we're going to be talking about this like 10 or 15 years down the road again. But it only takes that one. So everything has to go right all the time. And, it takes work to make everything go right. So, If you go to conferences where the Marriott modular folks are talking about this, they're dissuading people. I mean, they're telling people, like, don't jump into this unless you're ready. Like, they're vetting, they're going to meet, they're going to every single factory in town, and they're kicking the tires. I mean, they are very, they are, they, I think it's, they're wonderfully skeptical about people who are getting into this as a fad. Uh, and, and I think, you know, so, then, so am I. You know, I think people should stay away unless they really want to do this, and they're super committed to it. And, you know, our general contractor is, you know, the future of his business is based upon the success of this project. You know, we can design buildings typically. I, I, I like doing it both ways, but I, in theory, I'll have a career as an architect doing non-modular work. Our modular contractor isn't, right? This is what they do. Uh, so that level of investment, I think, is critical. And you, but you need ownership groups who, who believe in it. Yeah. You guys, uh, you pay sales tax on the, unit, the whole unit. Is that a fact? Is that I think we do. I think we did. Uh, I think we did. 
And that was coming from Louisville. I, I'm sh I think I think we pay taxes on the materials shipped into Poland, so we're. It's you pay once to get it to yeah. Poland, but then you don't pay it on on, on the way in. Shit. Well, yeah, ship them to the factory. Yeah, and Louisville um, Concord Purchasing Department purchased the FF&E and sent it to the factory, Champions Factory. In our New York project setup, our general contractor is handling the FF&E in the rooms and making sure it all gets to Poland and get in. So we've done it two different ways. But that, as you know, that just means a lot of money up front. So you're oh, yeah, the just just know that it's all front drawings are front loaded, education's front loaded, money's front loaded. But at the end, when it starts rolling, um, it's less risk. Yeah. It's already done. So like the cash flow analysis, the whole Excel thing that I have to look <laughs> totally different, right, for the lenders, and then to have to talk them through that yeah. and get them comfortable with it. And it was a challenge, and the lenders, and then the insurance company, because they the insurance company is like. We're paying all this money, it's going to be in the factory, who's insuring it, then who's insuring it on the road, and once it gets stacked, or why it's, I mean, it was, again, it was an education and a lot of phone calls, so. That was actually my question, was the collateral is motion, how does the lender look at, like, what So there are some laws. I know in Louisville there's some laws. I mean, when you're talking modular, they own it w until it gets to the site. But we we had some agreements. I mean, the insurance companies were just like up in arms. I can't, I think I had a, no less than a half a dozen calls with the same people trying to explain to them how it all worked. Um, so we did get a little more insurance for the roadway, even though it's supposed to be covered all the way from the from factory to the job site. Um, it, again, it was education for everybody. <laughs> Just because it seems it's very process oriented, is there any other like fee basis to perform? Like, like, is there any IP fees or any other patent fees, or anything like that? To go well, you've obviously you've got a big fee up front that we paid to like Champion for their up front design work. That was you know six plus figures um, that you wouldn't have right. I guess you do, but it's kind of hidden into the conventional general contract yeah. pricing through all the different shop drawings that are all spread out. Whereas you're getting a literally a set of shop drawings created by the modular company way up front um, that you're paying for, again, way front loaded. So that, that's one thing that you know could surprise you. But other can't think of any other. Yeah, I mean, in theory, there's a few different methodologies for modular for the mods, and each factory has some things which they have some patents pending on. You're not paying for that IP. I mean, I think it's a little, we had a 5C situation where we're working with another modular manufacturer that has a slightly, um, it's a funny thing because there is IP, You're, but like there's IP embedded in this project, but it's everyone's IP, so we, we haven't necessarily been very, I think, good about filing patents necessarily, but like when you work on another project, you never just inherit the system that that manufacturer is using. You're going to have to tweak it, at least if it's a non-prototypical building. So that tweaking process, we, we did have an interesting situation where we had to discuss setting some limits on what IP was theirs and what would be our contribution. But I, it's not an ownership cost. I don't think that, that plays into it. Is, is there um, a weight limit to a module because of transportation? That's a good question. Go ahead, see, and there's width. Yeah, I mean, Danny knows too. Well, I mean, ours are, ours are 20,000 pounds, and that is no big deal relative to um, the, the maritime shipping. And it's one mod per truck, so that's fine for the truck, and it's certainly nothing for the crane. So, so it's just, but I'm guessing the lowest common denominator there is the truck on the road? Yeah. So, width, I think, width is 15.9. Is, they don't want to go more than 15.9 on the road, and that's just transportation. Uh, there's a logistics plan you have to file uh, probably with the state, with FDOT, and to make sure you're not, you know, going under bridges you're not supposed to go under. So it's, uh, I mean, it's a whole logistic. I mean, in New York, you're probably shipping to, to yard, but in Louisville, we had to uh, get them there and track the truck and get permission all the way. But the, the 15.9 would be 
outside to outside. Yeah, and that if, you, if you're above 14 feet, it requires a police escort. Yep. And so there's an. So, in, so what about the width? Well, that is the width. Yep. 159 is the width. The length oh, is so, like. So 59, 59 is the width outside to outside. No, anything no, north that's of the max feet. going on the road. Yeah, north of 14 feet, you need a special police escort. Less than 14 feet wide, you don't. Um, yeah, but I'd also say this, like you know, when you like what they did in Louisville, as you probably saw in the video, they had guest room corridor guest room in one mod. Um, that's an awful lot to do in steel. A lot of deflection you're going to be managing if you do it that way. So ours are just guest room corridor. You can do it both ways, but at a certain point, the amount you can possibly stack. Um, reasonably given the kind of single lift and the piece of steel and the deflection, will ultimately bring you in a little bit. I mean, I think what these guys are doing kind of represents the max of what makes sense, yeah, which I'm is... I'm just thinking of constraints to the design that you wouldn't otherwise think of. Right. No, it's a, it's a good point. Definitely with... So if you think about, you know, a residence in or an element, no. you know, whatever, there's a situation there with having to redesign the room to fit within a 16-9 outside-to-outside dimension that you can't go beyond, and that's going to include, you know, six-inch studs at each end and drywall and all that. So, you know, you're talking under 16, 15, 6, inside-to-inside dimensions, you know, that's, that's less than a residence in, you know. Yeah. Well, and f just to be clear, 15-9, not the, I think you can get, I want to say, maybe 16, but with the furring and the wrap that all goes around the trailer, that's, that's where we're coming up with the 15.9. Well, well, Danny, I noticed in, uh, yesterday you had shown us one where you put three modules together yep. to create a two-bedroom, two-bed sort of thing. Right. So, but I noticed that in the connection in the living room, you could see where there were like posts so, stacked yep. together. Exactly. So in that, it's a great catch. So in that case, well, number one, we're not shipping them like that. So, so that really brings up a really interesting point, uh, which is mate line work. So just to be clear, like the reason we do the way, the reason we design the way we do is that, as Carl said, the corridors are left rough because everyone makes a mess, makes their connections, but the rooms are left clean. There will be situations, for example, in this project, our corner room just does not enable us to get to one of the shafts. So there will be a connection in the guest room just a few feet in, but still they'll be opening the door. That's not ideal. In the design I showed you, there's significant mate line work because we're really doing almost two C shapes that we're bringing together with posts in the middle. So we're going to have temp temporary framing in the middle for shipping. We're going to remove that and then make a connection. But that does mean we're doing mate line work in the room. Not perfect, but as far as I understand, there's really no way to go that wide to violate the dimensions these guys are talking about without doing interior mate line work. So when you're looking at the cost benefit analysis, you also have to say to yourself, you know, given the amount of interior mate line work that I'll have to do, should I just build it conventionally? We still think it makes sense to do it modular, but there definitely is a, you begin to eat away at some of the efficiencies. So we had a one bedroom unit in this where we did have an interior mate line. So the, the unit came together, I think it had storage up front and then it had a, a, the one bedroom piece and they put them together, had a knockout wall that you knocked out. So then you had, did have some drywall work that you had to come in and wrap the corners and yeah. finish it up. But yeah, totally, not, totally doable. You know, you think about a plan, like you're sometimes turning corners, you're far away. From, like there will be conditions that won't work perfectly, and you have to, you know, solve for that. Have you thought about like pre-assembling the floor or like then lifting that in place? Pre-assembling the floor? Like the whole floor you would pre-assemble on the site together. So I'll tell you a story. That was done, oh, well, actually, the, the 900 unit project in Brooklyn, the Dean Street rental building, they attempted to manufacture per floor. So for a while, they were basically dry stacking one floor of the building, assembling it in the factory, then shipping it and stacking it like that. What they found ultimately was that from a manufacturing mentality, you were losing the efficiency of the institutional knowledge of the workers doing the same thing over and over again. So by building a floor, pausing, and then building a floor and pausing, you weren't getting that output that you wanted. So uh, the manufacturer's feedback we have gotten is that it's better to go in a line in terms of the stacking, uh, it's really on demand. You do stack one floor at a time. You don't go vertically. So you manufacture vertically, but then you stack horizontally. Well, that's not always the case. They when did you... stack horizontally because they wanted to build one leg, and then they kind of like did went they? that. And... Oh, no kidding. Mm -hmm. no. I think they showed that in the video. So it's depending on yeah, I guess the it, system. It depends on the core, too, right? But we have to go that way because we have to advance the core. You guys had a big gap between cores, so I think it depends on the plan. That's a good point. We're going seven stories on the core. We're going four. Four. Yep. 
you know, we're going to cast four stories of the core, stack around it, pause, settle, cast up again, stack and settle. And we're going to let the we're going to give ourselves a chance to basically manage the core uh, uh, plumbness. So I do want to say this real quick because we're going to run out of time. Um, and this is a lessons learned. One thing that we really pushed, and we got a lot of pushback from the modulars, is when you go modular, we want it all modular. I mean, we have to build the cores, so, but we want very little minimum. If you don't push back, I mean, we got pushed back from Champion on a number of, well, can we just field, field build that piece? Can we just field build that piece? When you start field building stuff, you lose all the productivity, you, you, then it's safety becomes an issue. So. We really had to push like anything. Like if we were in a field build, it there had to be a strong, really strong reason to do that. Um, I know the Gurdons uh, 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 on the east, west coast. Um, they actually even they they build modular the stair piece of it, and then they just drop the stairs down. Champion didn't do that, but we were fine with that because ours was block. Um, That's an amazing point. You know, we're discussing right now that our temporary wrapping that we're using for the mod to get it from Poland to America will also be the final waterproofing and the flashing for the piece. And it's the same piece, one and the same. And it would be certainly easier to do it all in New York, but that's just not, it's more money, it's more time. So there's a lot of discussions we have where it's like, we could work really now to try and coordinate and solve it in Poland, but there's a lot going on, let's deal with it in New York, and you really have to fight yourself to not do that and do all the, as much as you can, get it done in the factory. So yeah, I mean, we wanted to do the parapets. I mean, obviously there's some shipping constraints, but just push to yeah. f not field build. I mean, I mean, we're going to the point where we are, we are putting our mechanical systems, we're, so our roof mechanical space are modules. In it will go our VRF units on the ground and they will lift and be pre-lifted. So even our mechanical equipment is not going on in the crane, it's gonna go into a mod. And that requires pre-coordinating the steel structural drawings and the mechanical drawings in Poland so they can accommodate that. So I have a question that kind of ties in there. Is there any, I'm sorry for the rest of the opinion, but are there any restrictions in mechanical systems when it comes to the structure? Is there a certain mechanical system that yeah. Well, if you're doing vertical heat pumps, you're, you're requiring that you're doing mate line connections in the room. So certainly VRF units or fan coil units in the ceiling that you can make the connections in the corridor are better. And that's, that's more just strategically speaking, but it's not like mechanically it couldn't work. It's just a, a less elegant way to do it. And obviously a VTAC and a PTAC works. So. And what drove you to order modular from Poland versus a company here in the United States? There isn't a company in the United States that's done high-rise volumetric steel we were comfortable with at that point in time. There are more now, and it's getting there. So one of the challenges, the reason I ask, one of the challenges that we found mechanically was bringing in the outside air, and we went with a, with a, uh, a window, a vertical window that brought in outside. Friedrich. Yeah. Not, not, We're, we're using a Mitsubishi VRF and we're bringing in outside air through a ducted system separately. Yeah, we've used the VRPs from Frederick and have had some issues, but uh, they fixed the most of them. I mean, that this, these, the systems that were, we just broke apart the building. We broke apart the structure. You can do anything that traditionally has been done because that's what we're doing. We're just putting it together in a different yeah. way. I mean, if your labor force can do five-star work, they can do it in a factory, right? So the limitations really just come down to, does it become a little more or less efficient given the way the mate line works? Right. I mean, outside air typically comes through the corridors and goes up through the roof. I mean, all the corridors are bare. You can bring that stuff. You just have to design the shafts and bring them down. <laughs> we talked yesterday, and you know the answer to that already. <laughs> um, Run it. Uh, so, obviously, we're pioneers to this, and you know, you're thinking probably what I was thinking, or maybe not. But I'm like, oh, these things are going to be built in the factories. I mean, it should be very nice and clean. I'm, I'm imagining like an auto factory that's been doing this for years, and you know, it's yeah. Um, we had some challenges with the modular guys understanding the expectations. Um, so. I think we, Marriott knew that. Marriott coached us up saying, hey, you're going to have to help these guys understand the expectations. Um, so we did have some challenges with some quality because, honestly, they didn't know. And most of these factories, well, at least in the States, 
or out in the middle of Pennsylvania where it's cheap to have labor and and their yeah. background is mobile homes. That's right. I mean, let's, the, we have to remember, uh, the, the cultural background is that the American wood frame modular industry did mobile homes, right? And so you are taking that labor force, you're taking that institutional knowledge, and you're, through ownership, you're sculpting a new direction, which is a fancy, you know, 3.5 star select service boutique design AC, which is right. not what they're typically producing. So. And, well, that's part of the reason why you go to Poland. I mean, their, their, their craft, their history of crafting cabinetry work and so forth is very, very different. So they come at it from the cruise ship building where they built cruise ship cabins, prefab, put them into buildings which were totally finished and really well designed. So it's just a, it's a different thing. It's institutional knowledge. That's, we're dealing with a different group. And it still should be better. I mean, the quality should be better. You get to, like, we punched the units at the factory before they got on the truck and went to the hotel, so it was just a lot more intense than I thought it was going to be. And there was some cracking of drywall and whatnot. I mean, you're, you know, they're rolling down the highway, so there's going to be some of that. So they had to go in and fix some stuff. And, you some know. shower doors broke, but I mean, it was very minimal yeah. once you got to the, the site. At the end of the day, we do it again. We're going to do it again. Obviously. Got two projects yeah. looking at right now. Any last questions? Thank you very much. Appreciate all the questions.